right, guys. If you are tuning in on Facebook or if you are one of the unfortunate people that has to deal with being friends with me and you're tuning in live on Zoom, then <laughs> welcome to the Pandemic Pantry with Chef Chandler, aka myself. Um, today we are going to be cooking with bitters. That's why you see all these tiny little bottles up front. This one's, I guess, hiding behind my Venmo. But uh, we did a cocktail class earlier today with bitters as the base spirit for our cocktails instead of whiskey or tequila or whatever have you. And I had a lot of fun doing that. And bitters are one of those things that not a lot of people think about bringing into the kitchen. Just because, I don't know, I, well, honestly, I don't know why. I think it's, I think a lot of people might be intimidated because bitters are very complex. And in experimenting with them in the kitchen, I have found that it either happens one of two ways. Either they're really, really good and accentuated in the recipe and bring something to the table, or they're very easily lost, which is really interesting because bitters are one of those things that when you're using them in cocktails, one drop too many can absolutely ruin a cocktail. So it was fascinating to me working with them in the kitchen and realizing that I could use up to an ounce, ounce and a half of something and not even be able to notice it. So I did a lot of research. I'm quickly going to make sure that this is actually live on Facebook and that I'm accessing it so that anybody's watching in the wings uh, that I can answer any questions you might have in case you're not joining us on Zoom. But um, I had a lot of fun playing around with bitters in the kitchen. I also had a lot of fun playing around with them in cocktails. But kitchen is my first love. I absolutely adore bartending, but it's like the child I was forced to have so that I can continue to cook in a way that is sustainable for my cooking career. But it's, it's been a really fascinating journey to really be behind the bar, just because I've learned to translate things that I do in the kitchen behind the bar, which I think is very, it's just very different. I don't think I approach the bar the same way certain people do. All right, Facebook people, I'm looking for you and failing. Let me see here. Um, watch, watch me have to ask for somebody to send me the link to my own thing. All right, I think, I think this is it, cool. All right, I got it. All right, so we are gonna be making four recipes today. There are so many other things you can be doing with bitters and we'll discuss that as well. Um, we're kind of skipping over making a main dish just because I felt like the recipes we're gonna make today would inspire people to experiment with bitters. They'd be a little less intimidating. Um, when it comes to main dishes, I find that most people like to stay close to what they know just because if it turns out poorly, then now they still have to eat the whole thing for dinner. Whereas if one of these is not to your liking, just toss it and then eat dinner anyway. So we're going to be making some candied bacon, which as a new friend of mine called human dog treats, which is not what I'm calling them. I think that's the best way to explain them. We're gonna be doing candied bacon. We're gonna be making a riff off of one of my favorite type of coffee beverages from Italy. We're also gonna be making a salad and we're gonna be diving into the world of pastry. And I'm seeing that my lighting is messed up because my roommates closed all of my windows. Let me fix that real quick. Open these. Oh. I don't know if this is going to All right. I ripped apart my house in my window. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so if you are mixing along at home or cooking along, I'm still stuck in cocktail mindset. If you're cooking along at home, you don't necessarily have to do all of these together, obviously, but we're going to be doing them in the following order. We're going to do our bacon first, and then we're going to move on to our salad dressing, and then our cake, and then our coffee. And the reason we're gonna do that is because the bacon and the cake would have to share the oven. So I'm hoping that the bacon will be close to done by the time I get ready to put the cake in. And that way 
we won't lose a lot of heat. Because one thing that you have to remember is when you're making a lot of things in the oven, the more you open your oven door, whether your oven's electric or gas, it loses heat. And then that much extra time is added to your cooking time just because it has to come back to the temperature that you want it and then continue to cook your item within that. So for our first order of business, we're gonna make bacon. I love bacon so much. I'm one of those Southerners. I have a little jar of bacon grease that I keep by my stove and I use it to cook a lot of things. I do a lot of my sautés that way, scrambled eggs in the morning, but we're just making candied bacon. There's a lot of different ways to make candy bacon. We're gonna go really easy where we're just tossing it with a couple things and then putting it in the oven. So what you're gonna need is bacon, obviously. I'm gonna be using a thicker cut bacon. It's not massively thick cut. You can use regularly cut bacon, that's fine too. My handy dandy package says that I bought Hormel Black Label Thick Cut Bacon and it's a natural hardwood smoke. So I tend to buy generic when possible. I'm very fortunate. My local grocery store, HEB, is one of the most amazing places in the world. Grocery shopping to me is like toy shopping for a child. I could spend hours in the grocery store. But a lot of stores make generic brands. Um, Whole Foods has 365. I think Walmart has Equate and something else. I know Publix has Publix brand, ATB has ATB brand. Some grocery stores are better than others with generic brands. ATB has always been phenomenal. So we usually have ATB bacon here at the house, but I don't know who bought this. I don't think I bought this, but it's still gonna work just fine. I like the fact that it's natural hardwood smoke. It's not a very specific wood. If you happen to get a specific type of smoked bacon, whether that's mesquite or applewood or whatever it is that you choose, just know that that smoke flavor will obviously combine with the flavor of your bitters. So when you're choosing the bitters for this recipe, definitely pay attention to the type of smoke that you put on your bacon. So I'm gonna open this pack. To make the recipe, you're gonna just have a large bowl on hand or medium sized bowl, which is what I'm gonna be using. The larger your bowl, the easier it's gonna to be to mix this bacon. I know you can't really see past my ingredients, but I'm gonna lift them up just so that you guys can see what I'm doing. So if you're making the bacon at home, we're gonna have our bacon. I have a cookie sheet that I've covered with parchment paper. And then I put one of these cooling racks on top. Cooling racks are used a lot in baking for cookies and for cakes and whatnot. You don't have to have one of these to make candy bacon. You can make it directly on the parchment paper, directly onto your cookie sheet. I just like this method because it allows a little bit of space. I don't know if you can see that, but I can put about two or three fingers beneath my cookie rack or my cooling rack. And that way the fat drips to the bottom and any sugars that end up caramelizing underneath the bacon won't give the bacon a burnt flavor. So I think this is my favorite method. Um, if I had to choose a second favorite method, it would be using a sill pat, which is one of those silicone mats that is a nonstick surface that you can add onto any of your cookie sheets. I do recommend using a cookie sheet that's a little dished or has a tiny bit of an edge just because we are talking about hot grease and that can be a burn risk. So I like to have something that'll kind of contain that as much as possible. So just have that ready if you're gonna be making this candy bacon. And then I'm gonna use a medium sized bowl of this glass bowl. So for our recipe, this recipe is for six strips of bacon. Um, I find that this works really well with thick cut bacon. It goes a little bit further if you have regularly sliced bacon, but not a whole lot. So I would say six slices is a really good ratio. Um, and honestly, I know a lot of recipes don't really translate when you double them up, but this one does. So if you're doing six, this recipe works well. If you're doing 12 or 36, just do the multiplication and it'll work out just fine. So we have six slices of bacon which we haven't put in here yet, but we're going to use six slices. And we have six tablespoons of brown sugar. I have light brown sugar today. Um, I got it from the neighbor who was giving it away. 
but I usually prefer dark brown sugar just because it has a lot more molasses note to it, which I think is really beautiful. But you can use any brown sugar whatsoever. If you don't have brown sugar, you can use white sugar, you can use coconut sugar. You can literally use any sugar. Just don't use alternative sugars that aren't meant to be used in the same ratio. So stevia isn't meant to be used as six tablespoons. It's a lot sweeter than regular sugar. So you wouldn't be able to do this with an artificial sugar. But we have six tablespoons of brown sugar and I'm putting directly into my bowl. And then for this recipe, I have Bitter Cube Bitters, that's the brand. The style is black strap. And I chose this because it's really heavy on the sassafras note. And if you're unfamiliar with sassafras, sassafras is a key component in real root beer. So it's got that like caramelly root earthy note to it that's really, really nice. You could use any bitters for this. You can use Angostura, which is a very common bitters. You could use orange bitters. There's like bourbons, cherry, all kinds of chocolate, mole bitters out there. You can literally use any kind of bitter. It's just gonna be a subtle added flavor to your bacon. It's not gonna be the forefront flavor. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use one teaspoon of these bitters. And if you're a bartender, it's like super strange to think of measuring bitters in anything other than dashes or ounces. But for the home bartender slash cook, half an ounce is one tablespoon. So if you just know how to translate your measurements, then you'll be fine. And I could have just poured this from my little bottle, but I'm using bitters. I like to use a little droplet possibly possible. So I have a teaspoon of my sassafras bitters. I'm gonna mix that into my sugar or pour it on top of my sugar. And then we're gonna get messy. We're gonna mix up the sugar and I really, really like mixing with my hands. And I know there's a lot of people that have issues out there if they don't see wearing gloves and whatnot, but I'm cooking at home, I'm cooking for me. I know I'm safe and clean, but being able to actually feel things with your actual hands allows you to know a lot more about your food. So I'm gonna just sit here and kind of take the sugar and kind of crush it and rub it between my fingers. And that's just incorporating the bitters into the sugar until they're all moistened, until all of the sugar is moistened really. Now, if for some reason you're doing this and you feel like your sugar soaked up all the bitters, but it's not very uniform, like the flavor's not all over the sugar, you can add more bitters. I've tried this with twice the amount of bitters and the flavor was just as good. And um, it wasn't one of those things where you added too much and the entire recipe was ruined. But when it comes to brown sugar, it gets moist really, really quickly. So it's always better to err on the side of less than more, because you can always add more. It's really hard to take away once you've added too much. So now that I've added my bitters and really incorporated them into the sugar, it's like this wet sand type of texture instead of a dry sand type of texture. Like right when the ocean goes out, you can like crinkle your toes in the sand. That's the texture we're getting for. So very simple. And then all we're gonna do is put our bacon in there. So I have six slices. I'm gonna start one slice at a time. I'm gonna bring over my cookie sheets so we can do it all at once. So I have my thing here. And I have my oven heated to 350. It's at 350 because that's the temperature we need for the cake. If you need to do this faster, you can put your oven on 375 to 400. However, when it comes to candy bacon, slow and low is my favorite way to go. And that's because it gives that sugar time to caramelize. It gives the bacon time to really have all that flavor soak in. So if I was only doing bacon and no cake, then I would have my oven at about 325 and then double, give or take, my cooking time. So, I had my phone go off. If you're on Facebook and I'm not answering anything because my hands are covered in sugar and bacon, I will get to you as soon as I can. So I take a strip of bacon, I'm literally just putting it in the sugar here, kind of tossing it until it's coated. You can use your fingers to just kind of rub it around each bacon strip. And then I'm sure it doesn't translate incredibly well on camera. Let me come over there and hopefully I don't make a mess. But you can see the sugars coated really well for the most part on both sides of the bacon. So your job is to make sure it's coated as well as possible. 
And then I like to very gently kind of trace the bacon just to get any loose particles off. Shake it if you want. And then I'm gonna put it directly onto my cleaning rack. And then I'm gonna just keep doing that. And like I said, this recipe is in theory for six slices, but if you have extra bittered sugar left over, then just keep going until you run out of bacon. Literally never met anybody that is mad because there's too much bacon. And just in case we ever become friends in real life, if you're a person that would get upset about that, just know that we probably wouldn't be able to be friends because bacon is amazing. There's no such thing as too much bacon. I also really like this um, particular bittered bacon recipe because if you are one of those people that likes Bloody Marys or cocktails with a bacon garnish, maybe you're making bacon fat infused vodkas or whiskeys at home while you're in quarantine, this not only makes a tasty garnish, but it just adds an extra dimension to something that otherwise might be kind of mundane. And I've tried this with, let's see, I've tried this with the Angostura. I've tried this with the Sassafras, which currently is my favorite. And then other than that, I would have to say my favorite bitters that I've used would be orange. And then I have a cardamom tincture at my house that's very, very special. You can make a cardamom tincture at home quite easily. The difference between a tincture and bitters is they're both a very intensely flavored infusion, if you will, but usually bitters are more ingredients. It's more complex, whereas tincture is one single thing. So orange bitters, while it says only one ingredient in the name, has other ingredients to give it its flavor profile. But I have a cardamom tincture that a colleague of mine in Italy made, very, very, very talented bartender by the name of Agostino Perone. And I used a very small amount of these cardamom bitters to make candy bacon one time. That was probably my favorite thing in the world. But because quarantine and life, I haven't seen Agostino in a few years. And I'm gonna hold on to those bitters until next time. I might experiment making my own, but he's a master of the craft, so I don't know why I bother if I have what he's made. So I'm gonna rinse off my dirty little fingers. So I have my slices of bacon on my rack, as you can see. And I'm gonna put this right in the oven. I'm gonna set a timer to come back to that in about 15 minutes and kind of see where it's at. And this is one of those things where I know not all bacon is created equal. Not everybody likes bacon the same way. Um, so it's one of those things where if you like your bacon a little softer and chewier, then you're going to pull it out early. If you like it extra crispy, then you're going to pull it out a little later. And we're going to pretend, like I didn't just put the bacon in the oven, I'm going to pull it out real quick because I forgot one crucial step. <laughs> uh, this, this is what it's like when you cook at home, right? We all forget things from time to time. So generally speaking, I wouldn't salt the bacon because bacon is already salty, which is why I forgot this step. I happen to have this beautiful smoked mountain sea salt flake. So I'm gonna just crush this up and sprinkle a little bit, very, very small amount onto my candy bacon. And that's just because anytime you make candy bacon, if you're buying commercial bacon rather than artisan bacon, it tends to be a little less salty than artisan bacon. So adding this is just that little extra, or as the French say, the je ne sais quoi, it's gonna make it really nice. So this wasn't in the oven before, but it's going in the oven now. And things like that is how you lose a lot of your oven heat. So do as I say, not as I do. Um, and now you know that even professionals make mistakes at home. But so we have used our bacon ingredients. 
Now we're going to blast on to salad. I'm going to go ahead and store my bacon. So when it comes to salad, I'm not a huge fan. I love vegetables. I love fruits. I love cheeses. So logic would tell you that salad would be a good fit. But I think I got ruined on salads growing up where it was just lettuce, tomato, croutons, and cheese. And a lot of lettuces are boring, and I really dislike raw tomatoes. I don't know what it is. It's been ever since I was little. The raw tomatoes are not my jam. I can make them my jam if they mix with other things. But for me to like a salad, it needs like 40,000 ingredients. I have found a way around that which is dumping a ton of dressing on my salad. And I know there's a lot of people out there that do this, whether you just like eat salad with your ranch or your Thousand Island or your Caesar instead of Caesar salad dressing on your salad. But I have discovered that finding the right dressing really brings a salad to a whole new level. And that makes me want to eat salad. And if I can make myself like something, I'm not a hugely picky eater, but if there's something I absolutely am not about and I can make myself like it, that's a really good thing. So I'm not making a fancy salad today. I have a little store about package of salad. So don't get too excited. Um, but this salad dressing is going to be phenomenal. And if I had made the salad from scratch, I would highly suggest using maybe a spring mix, some pitted cherries or some dried cherries, some crumbled goat cheese maybe a little bit of radicchio to add a nice little bitter touch or arugula, and then this dressing. So this particular dressing stems from a bottle of bitters that I've had on my bar forever that I bought for one special occasion and just never revisited this bottle. I've thought about it. I've tried it maybe here or there in one or two cocktails and it just doesn't seem to mesh. And surprisingly enough, it works beautifully in the kitchen. So I have Fee Brothers Plum Bitters. I know it's really hard to see because now I open my window and it's there. All right, I'm gonna be like those makeup girls on YouTube. This is the number nine brush. <laughs> Actually, no, it's Plum Bitters. But, so what I like about Fee Brothers, if you were not a part of the cocktail class earlier today, definitely check it out. The Fee Brothers Bitters Company has a beautiful history that is just fascinating to read. You talk about being down on your luck, not once, not twice, not even five times, but more than that, just having properties burned down and people die and licenses get revoked. And then to this day, it's still a product you can find and they have been wildly successful. So if you ever need a little inspiration because you're down on your luck and thinking things aren't going your way, you don't have it as bad as you think you do, read the Fee Brothers history and learn some stuff. So for our salad dressing, very simple ingredients. I'm gonna be using plum bitters. You can make this with any bitters you have at home. I highly recommend fruit-focused bitters. Plum, cranberry, orange, grapefruit, lemon, all of those would be really great. A lot of the spice ones would work as well. However, if you wanna venture outside of the fruit bitters, herbal bitters, beautiful way to go. I did this exact same recipe with Scarborough's herbal bitters. That's a big mouthful. Scarborough's Herbal Bitters. <laughs> and those were really nice. Um, you could do this with Peychaud's as well. It's also a very classic type of herbal aromatic bitters. So I have my plum bitters. I have this beautiful extra virgin olive oil. I have this beautiful sherry vinegar and some honey. And a lot of the time I do classes or I'm working and I feel like I have all these special tools and I'm not even highly equipped at home compared to some of my colleagues. But I'm also a country girl at heart and I love just making do with what you have. So we're gonna be making a bitter based vinaigrette for our salad. And we're gonna use my favorite technique, which is a jar. We're not gonna emulsify with anything special or fancy. We're just gonna use a jar. So, I got some garlic powder last week and I have my entire spice cabinet in these really nice little glass jars. So then my garlic powder is gone and I was left with this beautiful little jar that holds anywhere between like three to four ounces. I think it's like 3.5. And this is great because I never need more salad dressing than this. I'm a very big meat and potatoes kind of gal, but 
we're going to be making salad dressing in the tool jar and we're going to emulsify it by shaking it like a cocktail. So we have a whole lot of building that going on. So what we're going to do is we'll get out our proper recipe first and make sure all the ratios are correct. I don't forget things like I did with the bacon. So we need all right so we're going to do some math because a lot of times i have people reach out to me and not know what the conversions are for measurement so this is going to seem really tedious because i'm measuring it in very small amounts but i'm going to give you the full amount this is just in case you can't find your tablespoon or in case you don't know how much is in an ounce so we're going to use two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. That translates to six teaspoons of extra virgin olive oil. And you can use any other kind of oil. There's a lot of really nice types of oil out there. You have avocado oil, walnut oil, um, you can use grapeseed oil. There's a lot of different really beautiful oils. Some of them are gonna be much heavier in flavor, such as like sesame oil, it's incredibly overpowering. So just keep in mind that whatever oil you use, you definitely wanna use something that'll blend with the flavors that you're going for. So we're using our olive oil, that was two tablespoons. We're gonna use one tablespoon of sherry vinegar, or in this case, three teaspoons. So one, two, three. Cool. Make a huge mess. Please don't pour it because we don't have the little ones. So we have our sherry there. Clean up our mess. Now, if you can't find sherry vinegar, I will say um, I've had this recipe for a while and I've always liked it with sherry vinegar. But when I went to try and acquire sherry vinegar for the class, it was actually a lot harder than I thought. So it's very expensive on Amazon comparatively. They didn't have it at my local grocery store. My local liquor store had it. So I'm not sure what y'all's liquor store has, but definitely check it out. Mine has more than just alcohol. It's got cheeses and oils and caviars. So I got mine at the liquor store, but if you can't find sherry vinegar, champagne vinegar works really nice. White wine vinegar works really nice. White balsamic vinegar. If you try anything else vinegar wise, then you might need a little bit of a stronger flavored bitter because the plum bitter is nice, but subtle. So we're gonna use Oh, I told you to do this one. So we're going to use one teaspoon of plum bitters. I'm going to put that into my jar as well. And then we're going to use a teaspoon of honey. And this is one of those things where this is the most basic, basic recipe for this particular salad dressing. You could add salt and pepper here. I don't really feel like salt is necessary, but a little pepper would be nice. You could also add things like an herb or garlic, or perhaps you want to add grated carrots. There's a lot of different things you could do here. It's just, I really want the bitters to shine through, so I'm not going to add a whole lot of ingredients in here to kind of blend with it. I want the bitters to be the four flavors. So this is why I love the jar. We have all of our ingredients obviously unemulsified because we just poured them into this little jar. Then we're gonna close it. Usually when you're making a vinaigrette, people will tell you to whisk it, to put it in your blender, use an immersion blender or a frother. I just like to shake stuff. It's also really good for your cardio if you're making a ton of salad dressing. I'm not, but you give it a good shake for about, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 seconds. And then you have this beautifully emulsified salad dressing. And I love this because this will fit in your fridge just as so, and then if you need it, and it's separated again as vinaigrette soup, just shake it back up. So, we'll take the salad bowl and my store-bought salad, because we fancy all the time. Let's see, this is a field greens blend. So it's romaine, endive, carrot, radicchio and for the day. I'm only making a small portion. I'm gonna just put a little bit in there. Oops, carrots everywhere. Like I said, I like a lot of stuff in my salad, so this is kind of gonna cut it, not quite. 
And then if you happen to have even one of those bottles that um, a pour spout can fit into, then that would be even better in my opinion because then you can drizzle automatically. But if you're fairly good with steady hands, then you just drizzle it lightly over your salad. And I'm still gonna toss this. So if it's a little heavy here or there, it's not a big thing. But also I love salad with my dressing as opposed to dressing with my salad. So there's just a fork and a spoon. Like I said, this is a fancy salad. Buy the store. Just toss my salad. And then after this, if you were doing a store-bought salad, I would probably add in, like I said, either some dried fruits, some cheese, nuts. Oh, I love nuts in my salad. Maybe like some toasted almonds or walnuts. And then good to go. Magical salad and bitter dressing. Very simple, very easy, guys. And see, it's still very emulsified. Giving it a nice hard shake will keep it emulsified for quite a bit. It'll start to separate eventually once it's in refrigeration. Yeah, salad for dinner. And now for the very exciting part. I don't dabble in pastry a lot. There's a good reason for that. Pastry is very, very scientific. So it's not as preformed as cooking. Whereas if you're making like a ragu sauce and the recipe calls for half an onion, quite honestly, if you use a whole onion, it's gonna be just as good, if not better. But in baking, if it calls for like, I don't know, two cups of flour and you use two and a half, you ruined the recipe. It's gonna be too dry. So it's very scientific. It's not that it's not a creative form. Baking is a beautiful skill. Um, and I think I just kind of developed a certain distaste for it after being forced to decorate cakes on end as part of my culinary training. I have nothing but respect for people that strictly have pastry as their, as their main skill. They're the most patient people I've ever met. So my hat's off to you because I couldn't do it. But occasionally I like to dabble. And when I do, it's definitely kind of free form. So we're gonna be making something that I absolutely fell in love with when I was in Italy, and it's olive oil cake. And I have said that phrase now, I think four times this week to people who are not in the industry. And they're like, you're giving me oil cake. That sounds terrible, I don't want it. And I'm like, okay, if I said butter cake, it would make sense, right? Because in the United States, we're very accustomed to having, oh, that's check out the bacon. And check out bacon. But we're, we're used to having butter in our pastry and butter is good. So if you just can't wrap your head around the idea of an olive oil cake, just imagine that we swapped out the butter for oil and it's still a cake. It's still going to be tasty. I'm going to check out bacon. Oh, yeah. We're going to try something. I really want to see if y'all can see inside my oven because it's just delicious looking. So I'm going to see. I have this beautiful old school oven because I live in a house made from the 70s. Look, look at that. Look how delicious that looks. I can hear it bubbling. Oh, oh it's almost there. It's not quite there yet. Maybe it's too excited. Yeah, yeah. Let me set you guys back up here. Set my information back up there. So another three minutes on the timer for our bacon and then we'll check it. All right, so back to our cake. For this cake, we're gonna be doing two different components. We're gonna be making the cake base, and then we're gonna be making a kind of like a whipped cream to go on top. So I like to blend this by hand or mix it by hand. Um, I use a whisk. You can totally use a stand mixer or even a handheld mixer. Either of those would work, but it's not an incredibly technique heavy recipe to where you have to whisk a lot of things in different times and formats and put them in differently. So one bowl, one whisk, you should be able to do it. So if you don't have fancy equipment at home, this is a very accessible recipe. So I'm gonna make it in here. I'm not gonna lie guys, one of the people tuning today is a very skilled pastry chef. She said she's not patient. I know otherwise. I know I know she's patient. I know her face is not. Her face is a lot before she does. But that's cool. That's how I like my people anyway. My face is super loud all the time. But 
We'll find out later if she approves of Mary's idea. I'm really hoping she does this on her own and replicates it. And it even makes it better. Like, I love it when pastry people take my recipes and they're like, hey, you could have done this better. And I'm like, oh, thanks. I wouldn't have thought of that. Or, you know what? I didn't have the patience. Thank you for doing the work for me, which is my favorite. <laughs> but what we're going to do for this particular cake, I've tried mixing wet into dry and dry into wet, right? Those are the two main ways most recipes are built where you have all of your dry ingredients together and you pour in all your wet ingredients and mix them or vice versa. Um, I've tried it both ways. It doesn't create a huge change in texture or ease of making the recipe. So honestly, just do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. And if that doesn't sound good to you, then I don't really know. <laughs> but for our dry ingredients, I'm gonna explain something very important just to make my pastry chef friend happy. Let's see. There are two types of measuring cups in the world for the most part. You have ones that look like this, like pitchers, and you have ones that look like this, like little cup scoops. These are intended for dry ingredients. These are intended for liquid. And I know this says one cup, and this will say one cup, but they're not actually the same. That's the information you're supposed to know, that all pastry chefs wish people knew at home. But then country girl inside me is going to tell you that our date is probably ready. But the country girl inside me is going to tell you but unless you're replicating a lot of this on a very, very large scale, or unless it's a really fancy recipe, 70% of the time, it's not going to be really good. But if you have both of these types of measuring at home, dry, wet, or yes, as LG is putting in the commentary, a scale is best. That is absolutely my favorite. But I did one of our first cooking classes with the scale and then had a lot of comments about how people do have scales at home. So I have two responses to that. First one is, I'm sorry, and I've modified to adjust, but also get on our level, get better. We're here to teach you how to be like us. So get a scale and then come at me and I will give you all of the dry measured ingredients and weight the same for liquid. So let me check my bacon real quick. Smells absolutely delicious. And give it about another three minutes. Once it gets close to being done, and like I said, it's kind of a hit or miss depending on how you like to bake it, right? It could be, let's see, this has been in 18 minutes at 350. And for me, it's still a little too soft. But if you really like chewy bacon, then now would be the time to pull it out. I'm gonna leave it in for another three to six minutes and try to crisp it up a little. But keep in mind that once you pull it out and it cools, because this is not something you can eat hot out of the oven, it will literally steer the roof of your mouth off because not only do you have hot fat and meat, it's covered in piping hot sugar. So that is a huge no-no. You have to let it cool. And once it cools, that sugar is gonna harden a little bit and also help your bacon crisp up. So back to our cake. We have in here, in case you're wanting to write down the ingredients, I've measured out most of my dry ingredients here. So I have two cups of flour, which I did measure with my dry scoop, but I put them in here for purposes because I don't have a lot of boys. But we have two cups of flour, one and a quarter cups of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of baking powder, and that's it. So those are all of our dry ingredients. And I'm gonna just put those directly into my bowl. Now you do wanna have off to the side an additional two tablespoons or so of sugar. We're gonna use this to sprinkle on top of our batter right before we put it in the oven. So I'm gonna just keep that over here to the side. So dry ingredients in the bowl. And now we're gonna add in our wet ingredients. Well, actually no, scratch that. Before we add in our wet ingredients, the recipe calls for the zest of one orange and one lemon. So we're gonna do that really. And if you don't have a microplane or a zester, a lot of cheese graters have like a fine grate option. It's not as fine as a microplane. And all microplanes are not created equal. They have different ones that get different shapes. But either way, the goal is to very lightly grate all of the skin off of your citrus fruit. 
And by that, the easiest way to gauge that is grating until you see the white. You're trying not to grate any of the white pit because that's really bitter. We just want the flavor from the skin. Now, if you make this recipe and you change up your bitters or your juices, as you'll see when we get to the liquid ingredients, you can also change up your citrus fruits. You could use grapefruit, you could use lime, you could get really fancy and use Buddha's hand, Meyer lemon. But one thing I really like to address is whenever you're doing stuff like this, don't toss this. This is so viable. If you're making the cake now, now you have a whole lemon and a whole orange left over, go over to my cocktail video from earlier and then fresh press some lemon and some orange juice. And make some cocktails. It's a great way to use it. Or you can pickle them, preserve them, make jam, make lemonade. So many different ways. Add it to your tea, make a hot toddy tonight. Don't toss a very viable fruit, especially in times of quarantine where sometimes finding ingredients can be hard. So you can actually zest your fruit at any point and add it to the recipe. I like adding it in with the dry ingredients because I'm going to give it a light toss in the flour and that'll actually help all the little pieces of zest separate and then they'll be more uniformly spread throughout the cake. Hey, it's pretty good zesting now. Right. So we have our naked fruit that I'm going to put on my back counter to use later for juice. And I'm going to just give this a quick little whisk. I'll add in there the dry ingredients and the zest. And then we're going to start with our wet ingredients. In here, I have pre-measured one and a quarter cups of milk and one and a third cups of extra virgin olive oil. And I'm actually using the same olive oil that I use for my salad dressing. I'm gonna pour that in there. And I just love having everything pre-measured. It's like my absolute favorite. And then we're gonna have some juices. So in here, I have a quarter cup of fresh orange juice. You could use bottled, that's absolutely fine. And one ounce of lemon juice. I'm gonna pour that in there as well. Smells like our bacon's done, so I'm going to pull that out real quick. Let's see. Let me show you guys what that looks like. Oh, yeah. So you see all that caramelized stuff on the bottom? That's stuff that I don't really like touching my bacon because I don't want it to get bitter and burnt in the flavor. So that's going to sit on my stove to cool. Then we're going to be using orange bitters for this cake. We're going to use one ounce. I'm actually going to put a jigger for this. So one ounce is approximately 70 drops. If you're going to be baking a lot with bitters, you can definitely remove the little stopper that makes it come out in drops. But because I use these for more than one application, I like to leave that in and then just take my time filling up my jigger. So that's one ounce of orange bitters. And then I'm going to add in three eggs. Now that I've pulled the bacon out, I definitely, if you're pulling something out of the oven or opening the oven, you want to give it, depending on your oven, 10 to 15 minutes to come back to the original temperature that you had it at to make sure that it's still there and you don't need to adjust the dye. So before I even put this cake in there, I'm going to give the oven 10, 15 minutes to come back to temp. So break up the eggs, slowly stir or whisk. And we're just incorporating everything until we get a really nice smooth batter. Now the reason I like doing this by hand rather than through a machine, there is such a thing as over, wow, my screen is really bright. The sun must be coming out. But there is such a thing as like over mixing when it comes to baking and that can lead to really tough textures when you're making cakes and cookies. So if I'm mixing it by hand, that means that I can take it slow. I'm not dependent on the speed of a machine. And then I'm just gonna have this really nice blended batter. See if I don't spill this all over my computer. But yeah, 
You can see it's not like super thick, but it's also not super thin. It's very similar in texture to like a pancake batter almost. Yeah, so now I have this here. It's all nicely mixed. And what I'm gonna do, I made one of these in a springform pan. You can use a regular cake pan, a springform pan, Pyrex dish, but you wanna have, if you're gonna use a Pyrex, maybe an eight by eight, or if you have a cake pan or a springform, you want a nine inch. So I'm gonna be using a Pyrex today. And I want y'all, as I'm doing this, to imagine that it's around a springform pan for reasons that will later be obvious. And I don't use spray oil often, but with baking, it can be really easy. So I'm going to pour my batter directly into this pan. Very, very simple. rise but it won't rise a ton it'll like in this pan it'll probably end up being on the brim so once you have this ready you're going to take your extra two tablespoons of sugar that we kept on the side you're just going to lightly sprinkle this all over the top of the cake and that's going to allow it to brown really nicely give it a really nice texture as well it'll be kind of like caramelized on top which is always nice so just try to be as even as possible you could also put this in like a little sifter or a small strainer and definitely have a much more like uniform spreading of the sugar. I like to be rustic about things or lazy, depends on what you want to call it. But so I'm still waiting for the oven to come up to temp. I'm going to put this next to the oven and this gets baked depending on your mold, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. So if it's going to be deep, like you see here, you're going to be in the oven for at least an hour, but maybe you divide it into different little ramekins or cupcake molds, or you divide it into two loaf molds, then it would probably take 30 minutes to about 45. And that also depends on how consistent the temperature of your oven is. The temperature of the oven's at 350. So we had it the same for the bacon. We're going to keep it the same for the cake. You don't want it lower or higher because you want a slow, steady bake. So 350 is the temperature we're looking for. I'm going to put this next to our oven. I'll clear off some of our ingredient tools over here. So y'all have the space to see me. All right. And now, we're gonna do our whipped cream for our cake. So I could have just used orange bitters for the whipped cream, but I didn't want to complement, or yeah, I didn't want to complement the recipe. I wanted to contrast it and give it more depth. So I chose to use Hachos, which is a very classic aromatic bitter. Um, I wanna say it's from France. It says it's, for, no, it's Louisiana is where it is now. Um, but yeah. It's from New Orleans. It's always been from New Orleans. Let's pretend I knew that ahead of time. Yeah, they're this really bright red color. Honestly, I'm probably one of the very few bartenders that doesn't have a whole lot of experience with patients. But the more I've used them, the more I like them. So I found this. It's quite inexpensive. I think I got this little bottle at Walmart for like five bucks. So to make your whipped cream, you can definitely use a hand mixer. I'm going to be using a whisk. Use my hand, get in some exercise, see if I still got it. <laughs> but I'm using heavy whipping cream. And one of the really cool things about whipping cream, a lot of people use granular sugar. I like to use powdered sugar. The texture is always a lot nicer once you have it in finished. We're going to use about three quarter cup of whipping cream. We're just going to start whisking. Like I said, you can use a hand mixer. You can use a stand. If you do this by hand, it gets very tedious and very tiresome very quickly. Um, you can also actually put this in a jar and just shake the absolute crap out of it and it will mount and be whipped, which is also really nice. So I like to get it slightly thickened before I add anything else. 
Okay, so the next section. Show you where we're at. As you can tell, I've only been whisking for maybe about a minute and it's thick and creamy. It's not fully liquid like it was. There's different ways to measure thickness when it comes to meringues or whipped cream. Some of those are called a ribbon. So when you do this, you try to paint a ribbon on top of your whipped cream or your meringue. And the longer it holds on top where you can see the shape, then the thicker your cream is. If it if it disappears immediately, then it's too thin. So I like to have this fairly thick, but not crazy, just to where it'll hold a light ribbon on top for about five seconds, maybe seven, before it disappears. And then I'm gonna add in my powdered sugar. So we have three quarter cup of, ah, very true. Miss Algae is giving us all the pastry knowledge. So yes, metal bowl in a freezer helps keep your whipped cream or your heavy whipping cream cold as you're whisking it. It also helps it mount a lot faster. Mount is what we call it when it like whips up and gets thick. I'm using a glass bowl just so you guys can see it, but yes, if you have space in your freezer, chill your bowl. You can take literally the bowl from your stand mixer, pop it in the freezer, and then go ahead and whisk your whipped cream in there. So I have three quarter cup of heavy whipping cream. I have two and a half tablespoons of powdered sugar, but it is to taste. You can do less, you can do more. Um, if you're going to make this as the bittered whipped cream, definitely take it slow, whisk it together, get that flavor. Because once you start hitting full peaks on your whipped cream, it's going to be too late to add in more ingredients unless you fold them in. So for our pechos, we're going to do a half a teaspoon of pechos. Give it a nice quick little whisk. And because it's such a small amount, I know these are like really bright red, but honestly, the color of this whipped cream is like tinted pink. It's not even like super, super dark. All right, so now let's put in that, and as you can see, see I can whisk it and it's not fall anywhere, but there we go. See how quick that was? Now, if you're making a lot more than this, I would definitely use a machine, but I'm gonna put this in the freezer, or sorry, in the fridge like this until I'm ready to serve the cake. You should cover it if it's gonna be in your fridge for a long time, but let's see. Ooh, gotta move some stuff around, guys. So we have our orange bitters olive oil cake in the oven. We have our Pichos whipped cream in the refrigerator. Really quickly, I'm gonna show you how this bacon turned out. So I left this bacon quite chewy just because I'm gonna be reheating it later and I don't want it to overcook, but it comes out and it's this nice little strip. See, it's still kind of flexible, as you can tell. See, pretty flexible. But if you want it crispier, just slow and low. Remember that, because it's very quick to burn. Bacon is easy to burn anyway, but once we add the sugar, it just makes it twice as burnable. And then, burnable's not a word, but we're gonna go with it. And then I like to eat this just like this because I'm a savage like that. But I would chop this up, put it on that salad I made earlier. Chop it up, put it on a burger, put it on top of an omelet, put it on top of a bagel with some cream cheese, put it in a Bloody Mary. There's so many different ways. Anywhere you would think to use bacon, just swap this out for your regular bacon, up your game. Now we're going to make coffee. So in my time in Italy, I've been to Italy quite a bit, studied there and worked there. Some of my favorite colleagues live in that country and it is 
such a beautiful culture. They have so much to see and do, so much to eat and drink. And I used to work out there and there was a restaurant I would go to where we didn't have to show up till 10 in the morning and we would cross, I would walk past this little coffee shop on my way to work. In Italy, the coffee culture is wildly different. You don't really have sit down coffee places everywhere. Most people, where you walk up and they don't even ask you what kind of coffee you want. They ask you, do you want bubbly or flat? Because they're asking what water chaser you want with your espresso. You lay down a euro, roughly about a dollar, you take your shot of espresso, take your shot of water, and you get out. But occasionally, there's these beautiful places that have a sit-down service that have wonderful pastries. And there is a coffee called a Marroquino, which means little Moroccan. And it is probably one of the best coffees I've ever had in my entire life. And I've come to realize that unless you get it in Turin, Italy, there are a lot of variations. Turin, Italy is the birthplace of Yambuja, which is a hazelnut chocolate feast that many of us know under the name of Nutella. Now, there are lots of variations. Traditional Yambuja is not as sweet as the Nutella that we get in the jar, but for this recipe, you could totally use Nutella. So for a Marroquino, traditionally speaking, you would have a coffee glass. I'm using an Irish coffee cup that you could use just your regular coffee cup you use in the mornings. But traditionally, the inside of the glass is painted with this hazelnut chocolate paste or melted chocolate hazelnut concoction. And then it's painted on the inside of the glass. And then they have a shot of espresso, some foamed milk. And then my favorite way that I've ever seen it topped is with chopped roasted hazelnuts and some freshly ground cardamom. And it is such a sensory overload, but in the best kind of way, it is just intoxicating. So I decided to try and kind of amp it up a little just because I haven't had one in a while and I felt like being playful with it. So we're going to make a bitters version of the Marroquino. So it's the bitter Marroquino or the bitter little Moroccan, <laughs> um, but it's a very simple thing to make at home. There's a lot of different ways to play around with it. If you have Nutella, you don't need the baking chocolate that I'm going to use. If you don't have any of the toppings, drink it without it. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by making an espresso. I am obsessed with coffee. I have a lot of different methods of making coffee, but I happen to have a little stove top mocha pot. And a mocha pot is kind of the original espresso machine. It screws together in the middle and there's a water reservoir on the bottom. So there's water on the bottom, you put your coffee in this little thing, you screw it together, you put it on the stove, and then there's espresso on the top. And I love this. This makes two espressos. They make them up to the size of, I think, 12, give or take. They're great for camping. They're great in general. They make amazing coffee. And I actually have Eli coffee, which is an Italian coffee. I'm definitely a Lavasa junkie. I love Lavasa, but Eli was on sale. So I took it, I ground it up fresh. I've got my coffee in here. I'm gonna put it on the stove and make two shots of espresso. All right, so that usually takes a few minutes to make. So while that's making, let's go over the ingredients you're gonna need for this bitter marroquino. So, we're going to be using baking chocolate. Now, there's lots of different brands out there. It honestly doesn't matter which one you use. I have Baker's. It's a very classic brand. And I'm sure a lot of other brands do this as well. But one of my favorite things about Baker's is that when you open it, the little chocolate bar itself has, I don't know if y'all can see it, but it has the measurements on it. So I know that some, that's like a little lady, but then these ones in the middle tell you a quarter ounce. So each one of these is a quarter ounce. So if you need an ounce of chocolate, it would be four tiny squares. Half ounce would be this. Just the espresso pot like a pot still for making gin. Algie wants to know if I could use my espresso pot to make gin. I don't know. I feel like yes. Um, maybe I'll make a very tiny, tiny batch of gin. I would maybe do it if I had a larger espresso mocha pot. Uh, but I feel like with like a two espresso, 
ratio. It's not necessarily worth the experimentation, but who knows? It's quarantine. You do crazy stuff. Uh, but that's a good question. If I find out for sure, I'll definitely know. So for this um, coffee, I like to use a half ounce of baking chocolate. So that's going to be two tiny squares. You can use more, you can use less. If you're using Nutella, this would be about a tablespoon. So I, this glass is made of crystal. I don't want to put it in my microwave. It dulls the crystal. There's the possibility that it can pop. So I'm going to just put this baking chocolate in the microwave as is. Now, if you're making big batches of these, I definitely recommend using a Van Marie, which is where you put these over a hot water bath. But if you're doing it in the microwave, do it in 10 to 15 second increments. It's like cook it for 15 seconds, pull it out, give it a little stir. Another 10, give it a little stir. And that way you make sure it doesn't overcook. Because once chocolate overcooks, it seizes and it gets weirdly like chalky and dry. And then there's all these things you have to do to save it and it's not worth it. We're just making coffee mix. So the other ingredients you're going to need is some milk, some bitters. I'm using Angostura for this. And then I have cinnamon and almonds today to top my coffee. I have three and a half ounces of milk. So if you're mixing along, go ahead and measure that out. I'm going to check the chocolate. Not quite melted yet. So we're going to froth the milk. And a lot of people would tell you to use a frother. I know there's been classes before this where I've used a frother to make certain coffees, but we're doing like country techniques today. That's just kind of my jam. We used a jar to make salad dressing and we're gonna use a jar to froth our milk. It's gonna be pretty cool. All right, chocolate's getting there. And you're wanting the chocolate to melt so that it's spreadable. I'm gonna just use a spoon to basically coat the inside of my glass. If you have a pastry brush, that would be much, much better. But we're going to be using a spoon today because we're not fancy people. Checking our chocolate. Oh, yeah. So it's definitely malleable. I'm going to take this, put it directly into the glass. And work kind of quickly. Just basically stir it because that's going to let it close the glass. And I like to kind of pull up a little and just coat the insides just a little bit more. So there we go. Chocolate in the glass. First step. Second step. You're making it at home for yourself. You get to lick the batter. Also called quality control. That's some really good quality chocolate. I approve this message. So chocolate in the glass, espresso is making on the stove. And then what we're going to do to make this the bitter maraquino, I'm going to use eight drops of Angostura bitters. You could use a clove bitters, you could use the sassafras bitters, you can use hay shots, orange, whatever your choice is. I say start at eight, see how you feel. This can definitely handle more. It can handle anywhere up to a half ounce, depending on what kind of milk you're using. But start slow and then add because different chocolates, different coffees will add, act differently with the bitter. So I'm going to do eight. All right, so I have eight, and that's just right on top of your chocolate. And then to foam the milk, you want to make sure you put it in a jar where it has almost three times as much space as there is milk. So this is about three and a, three and a half ounces. So it's taking up almost about a fourth of my jar. Obviously, we're not going to put this jar in the microwave with the lid, guys. We're going to go heat it for about a minute, minute and 20. You want it to be slightly above baby bottle. Milk. And then my espresso is ready over here. And this is a double shot. Depending on how I'm feeling, I might put a whole thing in there. But the recipe is, in theory, for just one shot of espresso. Now, if you have nuts that you're going to toast to put on top of this, hazelnut would be traditional. I have almonds. I really like using salted nuts for this application just because that very small hint of salt is just going to round out that flavor profile. 
And I'm actually just going to microplane them on top instead of chopping them up because I already have my microplane on here. So I have my chocolate, I have my bitters, I'm going to get my milk. Okay. So very cautiously, once your milk is in your jar, I say I put this on for a minute and it ended up only needing about 40 seconds. So there's two ways to do this. You can put the coffee first and then the milk, or you can put the milk and then the coffee. Usually if you put the milk and then the coffee, it'll stay whiter on top because the coffee will sink through the milk. If you put the milk on top of the coffee, it usually kind of mixes together and ends up being kind of beige, which is still tasty, but it doesn't really matter. But I'm gonna put the jar lid on top. I'm gonna wrap this just because the glass can get a little hot. And then I'm gonna shake it. <coughs> while I check on Facebook, see if anybody needs help with anything. All right. So give it a little shake. I like to let it sit for just a minute. And then we're going to give it a secondary shake. So let me see if you guys can see the bubbles. It's already creating a foam kind of on top. So it's not going to be nearly as thick as if you use a frother. And I have a frother, but in case you don't at home, I wanted to make sure you had this recipe technique. So now that I let it sit for just a couple seconds, I'm going to shake it again. And it's important to remember when shaking hot liquids in closed containers, you can create pressure. So just be very careful when opening it, just in case. I'm going to pour my milk directly onto my chocolate. And then as you can see, it doesn't take up all of my glass. And then I'm going to just pour coffee, trying to stay directly in the middle. Bring that all the way up to the top. This one's going to hold about an ounce and a half. And then I'm going to take a salted almond, grate it on top. And put a piece down, place these salt. And take a tiny bit of cinnamon. I'm going to put it in my fine mesh cocktail strainer. Don't need a whole lot. Just slightly dust it. I'm going to put that over here to the side. Getting clumsy today. All right. So that, my guys, is a marroquino. And oh my gosh, it smells amazing. Also, you could dust um, cocoa powder on top, and that would work really well. But what is coffee without cake? So, you all remember how I asked you to remember that that Pyrex was actually round and not square? So, magic, movie magic. So, this is our olive oil cake. It has cooked for an hour. It's very important to let it cool. If you're going to unmold the whole thing, to let it cool for two hours. If not, it will fall apart. So we have our coffee cake. We have our queijos with cream. So we are going to have a slice of cake. I'm going to cut through this. And I will say, my little secret that I didn't tell you guys is once this comes out, I made this with the ounce of bitters and it's nice, but it's really subtle because all of those other ingredients just kind of round out and make it nice and soft. So when this came out of the oven, I took the orange bitters and then I kind of dashed a little bit on top while it was still warm to allow it to soak through the cake. So now I have this beautiful slice of olive oil cheese. And I'm going to take a dollop very healthy glass of this whipped cream and on top. And we're not fancy. I'm going to just let it fall on top. I want it to be tasty looking. And then, because it's orange bitters, I'm going to garnish that with a cute little orange wedge. And we have bitter marroquino and bitter olive oil cake. And I will be eating this for breakfast for the next four days, if not the next week, because I have a lot of cake, but a lot. But this concludes our cooking with bitters class. 
I really hope this inspires you to try some crazy concoctions out there. If you don't know where to start and this wasn't enough, other things you can do, bitters do really, really well in recipes for candied nuts. Does really well when you add it to certain barbecue sauces or if you're making like pulled pork or pulled chicken in a slow cooker, go big or go home. Just really try it. If you ruin it, just power through it and it'll be better next time. But um, if you want to try it more in pastry, honestly, the best way to start is wherever you have a recipe that calls for an extract, whether that's vanilla or almond or lemon, just swap that out for bitters and see how you feel about that flavor profile. Maybe you like snickerdoodles with Angostura bitters instead of vanilla. Um, it's just a lot of experimentation. So bitters are very exciting, but there can also be a lot more trial and error than with other ingredients when we're experimenting. So try them out in your kitchen, make mistakes and get messy as Ms. Friddle taught us, or maybe just taught me because I'm older. But I really would love to hear about anything you guys make with bitters. And this is unfortunately our last cooking class for a little while. I'm gonna continue just doing these cocktail classes for a bit while we stay in shutdown. And if you have any needs whatsoever, please reach out to me on Facebook, whether that's with questions about recipes you've done, recipes you're trying to make at home, or if you just need a private class, you can also reach out for that. But thank you for joining me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the live stream on Facebook, and I hope to see you guys next Sunday. Bye.